Welcome to A Magical Life, Health, Wealth and Weight Loss. I'm your host, Magic Barclay, Lead Practitioner at Holistic Natural Health Australia and number one best-selling author. In this podcast, I aim to give you practical tips on how to accelerate and sustain your health, increase your financial, spiritual and emotional wealth and to look at something that haunts many of us needlessly, weight loss. In some episodes, I'll have guests available to give you even more tips, but in others, the floor is yours. Drop us a line at A Magical Life Podcast on Facebook and let me know what you would like to know more about. Now, sit back and enjoy, because it is time for you to create and truly discover a magical life. Welcome back to A Magical Life. I'm your host, Magic Barclay, and today I'm joined by Tammy Cuthbert Garcia. Tammy and I were just talking off air, and we have so much in common. So rather than me balls up her amazing bio, I'm just going to say, Welcome, Tammy. Tell us about yourself. Hi. Well, Magic, I, I can't help but say first, did you really get named Magic? Long story, but yes, it's my name. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. What a wonderful name. I bet that is a uh, conversation starter in almost anywhere. I can't imagine. Well, that is. And the fact that I work with the earth, which I believe you do too. Yeah. So tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah. So, well, I started a podcast about natural health about uh, almost three years ago because I had this um, desire to spread the message about being able to heal from within and how the body heals. I felt like, you know, people around me were getting sick. Parents at school were quick to throw kids on pills. There was this culture that's been brewing for a few decades here in the United States, quite honestly, of a pill for every ill. And I felt like it was time to do something about that. So I took all my knowledge And as a mom and a wife and someone who has dealt with chronic disease in my family for a long time, I just wanted to get all the information I could. So I attended seminars and I took classes and I read books and I was kind of a crazy nut about it. And I became the community health nut magic. (laughs) Everyone would come to me with their issues. Um, And that went on for years. And so finally, as my kids grew up, I thought, okay, I need to get serious about this. I started studying holistic nutrition and became a holistic nutritionist. And um, I started, you know, organizing my thoughts more and, and reaching out for more information and spreading it and helping people work through uh, the process of their healing. And what was foremost of, of my learning experience was that we actually heal ourselves. And there is no healing that comes from outside of us. It is our bodies that heal themselves. And what we do to facilitate healing and health makes all the difference in the world. So that's kind of my story, other than becoming, um, you know, the community go to health mom and um, wife and all of that stuff. It's now developed into more of a bigger practice where I help people go alongside them as they discover their healing journey. Wow, that is fantastic. And I know what it's like being the go to. I have a lot of my friends now say, we don't see doctors now, we just ask you. Because (laughs) you're actually going to tell us what's going on. Or I send them to their their medical doctors with a list of questions because doctors need to be pressed back on. Sometimes, you know, they're here in the United States, our healthcare system is built in such a way that uh, a, a medical doctor gets about 10 minutes a day with a patient, each patient, 10 minutes, each patient, and they have to see so many patients a day. And so I like to send them in prepared with a list of questions that they can start to explore and kind of push back on that doctor to get the care that they deserve because it's about fast here in the United States. And I'm sure it's probably similar there, Um, you know, get them in, get them out. And that always isn't the best solution for us with our health. Our Medicare system actually gives the doctors seven minutes. 
Oh my goodness. Seven minutes to tell them everything that's going on in you, read previous tests, ask you how the previous treatment was, ask you if you have any reactions, concerns, side effects. So you can guess that not a lot of that actually gets done in seven minutes. Yeah. And this is something I teach too, is uh, taking personal responsibility uh, for your health is the, your should be your number one priority because nobody is going to care for your body like you yourself. And no one's going to care more about your child or your family member than you. So, you know, with this explosion of information that we live in now with the internet and with all of these wonderful authors that are, you know, blessing us with their knowledge about terrain theory and all this other stuff that we should be questioning at this point, you know, we should, we should be asking questions about this stuff. And the information is there. We have to take personal responsibility because uh, healthcare is a business. It is a gazillion dollar business and uh, people are making a ton of money off of it. And so whenever there's money involved, we have to make sure we're using discernment and that we're advocating for ourselves and healthcare is no different. Agreed. Agreed. Now, We are about healthcare and wealth and weight loss here on this podcast. And I ask all my guests the same three questions. Every day I'm amazed with the variation of answers that I get. So I can't wait to hear your take on these questions. (laughs) So here's your first one. What can your expertise do to accelerate health, not just the physical, but the emotional and spiritual health of a person? Because I know that you, just like I, treat with holism rather than the reductionism model that many doctors and professionals use. Right. The absence of illness doesn't equal health right? It's, it's not just about um, not having symptoms right now that makes you healthy. That's not necessarily the case, right? It is uh, health comes from, from a lifestyle. And I think that's where my approach is kind of a little bit different is I really work with people to try to help them understand why they should be wanting to build a lifestyle. And that can be a little cliche, right? Like it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. Well, but it is, it really is. And it's not about a diet being your lifestyle. Like if you're just on a keto diet, keto is your lifestyle. No, uh, it, it is way more than that. Lifestyle bridges over into everything. And so that's why I share a lot of information about truth when it comes to healthcare systems. So take the analogy of, of, um, you know, if you have bad habits, if someone had a bad habit and you saw that bad habit unfold in front of you, like smoking, maybe you grew up with someone who was a smoker and you eventually watched them, you know, deteriorate because of their habit that sticks with you. And choosing to not smoke may become part of your lifestyle. So it's like, you know, you don't smoke for several reasons. One, you know, it's going to deteriorate your health Two, you know, maybe it smells and you don't really particularly want to smell like smoke. Three, maybe you understand the context of the companies that make cigarettes, right? So there's a number of things that go into your choices, like not smoking. It isn't just, oh, I don't smoke right? Because if someone offered you a cigarette and there was no grounding of foundation of knowledge there, you might take it, right? So, but we unfortunately don't look at it from that perspective all the time when it comes to other health issues, particularly like nutrition, you know, people can be like, well, it's a sinful donut. You know, I have to have a treat once in a while. It's okay. And, and that's fine. And I I'm, I'm definitely work with people in their degrees of knowledge and understanding when it comes to their nutrition, but what would it do if people understood you know, exactly why that donut tastes the way that it does, if they knew what company was making it, if they knew that that company that made it was maybe just one of four companies that controls our whole food supply, 
Would that change your belief system when it comes to making that choice? So I work with people to, to expose information, to make them aware that a lifestyle is something that you should walk and be able to walk your talk pretty easily. It doesn't necessarily come down to needing willpower when you understand that, you know, that choice that you're making it actually feeds something that you don't support and doesn't align with your values. So that's what I help people discover. It's like, you know, when I first worked with a client, um, helping him discover that there was plastic in his subway, he was thinking that his sandwich shop was a healthier choice. And he was having these sandwiches quite often every week. Once he discovered that I gave him the, the information to look at that the sandwiches actually contain something called a dough conditioner, which is like plastic particles. He was able to make that connection in his brain that, oh my gosh, like I'm eating plastic. What would, what would long-term eating plastic do to my health? And then boom, that there's the connection for him. And he was like, oh my gosh, I'm never eating that again. <laughs> combined with the fact that, you know, processed meats are actually listed as a carcinogen. These are things people don't know. And so when you expose them, it's a gradual process. It doesn't happen overnight, but as you build this foundation of knowledge about our food supply and, and health and how that correlates um, with our rising numbers of disease and such things and costs in healthcare, um, then they start to think, wow, okay, like now I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take instead of, you know, going out shopping all day on Saturday from big box stores here and there, grabbing a quick bite to eat through a fast food drive through, I'm going to take the day on Saturday and go to this farmer's market. And I'm going to walk outside and I'm going to pick these deliberate foods and then maybe take that home with a, someone I like, a friend or family member, and I'm going to build a nutritious lunch together. And then that's my whole Saturday instead of a Saturday that keeps you locked in a car inside of a store with fluorescent lights, choosing foods that you know, may not be the best for your health. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about a lifestyle, it really is truly a lifestyle shift that I'm helping people discover. And that's so important, isn't it? It's not just taking a little bit from here and making changes or a little bit from there. It's really looking at everything that you're doing and why you're doing it. And I think we've almost become not even dissociated from real life like that, but numb. We've been mm -hmm. taught to discount everything that we've learned from previous generations and discount our gut feeling and just do what the consumerism market says to do. Yes, that's so true. We, it's become more of like robotic. I, I know uh, here in the United States, like eating out at restaurants is now an entertaining activity. Eating wasn't really meant to be entertainment. I mean, yes, celebratory uh, functions like birthdays, dinners, you know, things of that nature. Sure. It's celebratory, but people do this, you know, several times a week here. And what else do you do for entertainment? You know, there's other things to do. We can go for hikes, spend time in nature, build something together as a hobby. These are, these are supposed to be entertaining activities too. And here in the United States, we've really let go a lot of that kind of stuff, which is affecting our culture. And it's really centered around these, uh, you know, eating and eating as entertainment and uh, it's showing up in our health. And so we have to, we have to just be become aware of it and shift back to things that can be entertaining and um, enriching, but they don't, don't have to involve food every time. It's funny you mentioned that I actually went out to dinner last night and you know, we ordered a main and a mocktail each because neither of us drink and we ate our food and we were chit-chatting and then before we knew it, it was the end of the evening and I mean, it was the end of the evening. The staff were all trying to clear away the tables and shut down the bar. And they'd already come and asked us, did we want a coffee? Because it's last call for coffees. Did we want a drink? Last call for drinks. And we were still chatting away, completely immersed in our discussion. And realized that we're actually being thrown out of the restaurant. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And That's as we great. as we went and paid, 
the girl at the counter said, no one stays that long at a restaurant. You, you didn't even order starters or dessert. You just right. had a main. What were you doing the whole time? Or we both just looked at her and said, talking. What else do yes. people do? Yes. Yes. See, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful uh, story about how the food wasn't the center. It was maybe a tool to bring you two together just to have a place to sit, right? It wasn't the main focus. And uh, I think that's, that's really important. And there's nothing wrong with getting together just to talk. (laughs) I can't believe I have to say that, but apparently. I know, right? It it was really pointed out last night at this restaurant that yeah. My friend and I live in a different world. We weren't there for the meal. Right. As you said, that was the tool. We were there for the time together. Yes. And yes. how foreign a concept that seemed to the wait staff was really quite alarming, actually. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. Every time I do my grocery shopping, I buy m- most everything organic, as clean as I possibly can, local as as much as I possibly can. But um, the people who ring out my groceries are so astounded by the amount of food I'm buying. And I have two kids and a husband, so we're a family of four. And I try to shop for two weeks at a time. And they're just astounded with how much I'm spending on my food um, and how much food I'm buying. And I said, well, I only come here every two weeks. And, uh, you know, I make almost everything from scratch and at home. So yeah, yeah, this is it. Does does nobody else do this? And they're like, no, I've never seen an order this big. I've actually had that comment, (laughs) which I find so strange. I mean, people are cooking less and less. And um, as a result, we don't know what we're eating because when we eat out a lot of the time, we don't know everything that went into that meal. Um, It's impossible for us to know. And that's totally fine to do that once in a while. But again, what I'm talking about is multiple times a week, multiple meals a week, because that habit over a long period of time ends up weighing on us in our health. So those are, you know, those are things that we need to really think about before we, uh, you know, eat out all the time and use it as entertainment. 100%. I'm right there with you. Now, my second question, Tammy, is what would be your top three tips to creating wealth? So not just financial wealth, but also personal and emotional wealth. Ooh, good question. So this is, I'm fairly well versed in this because, (laughs) you know, I came from a working class, middle, middle class family, working class, probably lower to middle class. Um, My parents were both uh, laborers and then, you know, uh, managers of their department as they worked themselves up the system in their companies and stuff. So, you know, I didn't learn about investing. I didn't learn about passive income. I didn't learn any of these strategies as a kid. And so um, in 2007, I think my husband and I were probably the first to get hit with the mortgage crisis here in the United States. And it was the first time I really had to get honest with myself about what I knew about finances, including understanding the, my own mortgage which I now know I did not understand at all (laughs) when I first bought my house. Um, So it was a painful experience, but fortunately we were able to fight our way through that. But as a result, I dove into, because this is kind of what I do when things scare me or when things um, are going wrong and I don't understand why I feel like I need to learn about it. So we dove into financial literacy and uh, we um, decided that this would never happen to us again. So we sought out the information to understand what happened to us, how we got caught in the subprime crisis and why. And so understanding that dynamic of what went wrong in the U.S. mortgage crisis was huge in terms of us knowing how to avoid it now and in the future. Um, But it also taught us uh, that we needed to learn how to earn money in multiple ways. Uh, We learned about passive income. We sought out education through people like uh, Robert Kiyosaki. And uh, we learned the value of investing. And we were very 
excited about this new knowledge. It's kind of like, how come nobody told us about that? So one of the, the first uh, tips I would say is understanding passive income. Uh, everybody needs to understand what passive income is. That is income that you make for not having to exchange your time right over every day. So if you have an investment, like a copyright, something that you've copywritten, like a book or a game or something, and that can sell, you know, any time of day while you're sleeping, um, that is passive income. And everybody needs to find a stream of passive income. I, f- I feel very passionately about that. The second thing I would say is that the days of having one job and working that job and retirement and, uh, you know, settling in after with 30 years and in something and just retiring, those days are over. Many people have multiple careers nowadays, and that should be something that you embrace. Um, looking at something uh, in from the, the old lens of just, you know, heading out, getting a job and staying there for a long time and retiring, it's just not sustainable anymore. We need to open our minds when it comes to making money and understand that there are multiple ways to do that. So multiple streams. So passive is a stream, but you also need a multiple streams of income. So that would be my second tip. So it's always, you know, think about, you know, teaching fitness classes on the side, if that's something that interests you alongside of, you know, having passive income, like writing a book or, or something of that nature that you can um, invest in or a rental property, right? These are things that should be actually at the front of our list before we go out on our own and leave the nest, so to speak, we should be thinking about how we can generate uh, something in a passive way before we do that. And um, a third, I would say everyone needs to not care what other people think about you. <laughs> and yes, that is a financial tip because what I've discovered is that our wealth comes from what we love to do, what we're inspired to do. And too many times people, we were a tribal race, right? We're all part of the human race and we're very tribal. We have an innate yearning to want to fit in. And so too many times we disregard what our heart is telling us we should do. Too many times we put things on ourselves like, well, I'm not an expert at that. I can't do that. Well, that's a pipe dream or no, I could never do that. No, no. That's the thing you need to do. The thing that's calling you, the thing that fires you up, that's the thing you need to do. So find a way to do it. Even if you're tending to it on a part-time basis to get it going, you need to do it. This is what your purpose is. This is the thing that will never let you sleep at night because you think about it, right? This is the thing that you can give a sermon on, (laughs) right? To your friends and family that everyone has that one thing somewhere in them. And, you know, over the years we get beat down, we get told, no, fall in line, fall in line, get the job, do this, do that. And uh, that'll never work. You're never going to be able to do that. Well, yes, you are, because you're going to work on passive income. You're going to work on multiple streams of income and you're going to do what you want to do. And I really believe when you follow your heart like that, um, you're destined for wealth and success. There's some great tips. Thank you. Now, we do talk about weight loss here because it's something that many of us actually struggle with, whether it's severe weight gain or severe weight loss. It's an imbalance of something, but for everyone, it's different. So what tips do you have around weight loss? And I guess the listeners would want to know, have you ever battled with your own weight? Because, you know, many experts in inverted commas will try and tell people how to lose weight. The first Mm -hmm. question the patient asks is, have you been in my shoes? Yes. Yeah, sure. I grew up um, battling my weight, you know, at uh, 13, I became more of a woman (laughs) than I was like overnight, basically. And so I was constantly getting described as curvy in a time in the 80s. I grew up in the 80s, early 90s. So I was constantly being described as a curvy woman in a time when it wasn't cool to be curvy. Now we have Kim Kardashian and we have all these, you know, uh, ladies that are embracing their 
their curves and it's wonderful to be curvy nowadays, but it wasn't that way in the eighties. It was, you know, skinny and everyone should be skinny. And, you know, the, the uh, Kate Moss, I think she was like one of the top models at the time. She might've weighed 80 or 85 pounds. And, um, that was not the case for me. You know, I was an athlete. I was a figure skater. So I had some, and I still have some good size legs on me. <laughs> they're just, they're not ever Kate Moss type legs. So yes, I really battled with that. And I tried multiple diets and I would get down um, to a point that, you know, it was noticeable. I was losing weight and stuff, but I would, could never sustain it. I would always kind of pop back up 10 pounds, 15 pounds over that because my body just didn't want to stay down that low. And uh, as I grew up, you know, and got married and stuff, I, I was fortunate enough to marry a wonderful man who embraced my curves. And it took him years to deprogram me. It literally took him years to deprogram me because he would tell me over and over again that not all men like skinny women. Like, that's not the thing here. Men like curves. Like, well, you're crazy. What are you worried about? And, you know, it took years, but eventually I believed him. And, um, and I believe that now, you know, it's, it's, it's about being comfortable in your own body. It really truly is. And when you come into a new lifestyle, it's more about living this healthy lifestyle. It, it, it is such a better journey than focusing on this one goal. So like once I stopped focusing on hitting that specific number on the scale, I, I really was able to live my lifestyle and appreciate my body for what it was doing for me every day. That was a huge thing too. Um, my mom passed away from cancer in her early fifties. And that also gave me, I feel like it was a transition over time. Every decade, I got a little bit better with how I handled my weight or how I saw my body. And one of the transitions was definitely getting married. The second transition I could say, you know, was having my kids and being okay with putting on weight and then letting it come off naturally through breastfeeding and, and getting back down slowly, not as quickly as I would have liked, but being okay with that. These were all things that I struggled with, knew what the right thing to think was, but still having that programming as a young teen and, you know, in my early twenties of growing up in the eighties and thinking, Oh, need to be skinny, need to be skinny, need to be skinny. This is a deprogramming process. And so that was another milestone is having kids. And then when my mom passed away, I really felt renewed and a sense of gratitude for how healthy my body was. All the crap I've put it through, you know, starving it, uh, running millions of miles, marathons, and, uh, you know, beating it up all the time, telling it it wasn't the right shape and it wasn't, didn't look the right way and my legs were too short. Well, those are my mom's legs. Those are my mom's legs. So when she passed away, I started looking at my body differently. I thought, wow, you know, I have this trait of hers that I now walk with every day and my body shows up for me every single day. You know, is it exactly the way I want it to look? No, but there are people right now today wishing that they didn't feel pain or have to go through the process of laboring into a disease and, and ultimately to death and watching my mom do that gave me a new sense of gratitude for my body. So that helped as well. But the wonderful thing was too, is as you fall into this lifestyle of eating whole foods that are satisfying, looking at food from a perspective of how will that satisfy me? Like, is it calorie dense in a way that isn't going to sustain me? Or is it nutrient dense in a way that it will sustain me? Using these strategies when choosing food, it just weeded out all the kind of the mistakes that I was making that weren't getting my body to a point where I want, where I felt that it should be. It just kind of happened naturally. But when I was focused on a number on the scale, I could have not eaten for six months and I probably wouldn't have achieved that goal. 
<laughs> and that's really how it was. It, it fell into focusing on multiple things in my lifestyle that I really believed in that aligned with my values that led me to the shape I am in today, which is probably better shape than I was in my twenties. I'm very grateful for the state that my body is in today. Thanks for your candidness there. Now I'm going to wrap this episode up, but what I love to offer the listeners is a freebie. So what can you offer the listeners and where can they find it? Oh, yes. Well, I have a couple of different places they could get um, some some good stuff from, but the number one place to visit probably is uh, naturallyinspiredpodcast.com. And where you go, go to that website, you can download my free book with is 13 swaps for that it's called. And these are things that you can swap out to enhance your lifestyle and, and drive it in a more healthy way. And while you're there, you'll be able to see that there is hundreds of hours of content with scientists and doctors and filmmakers all around health and what real health is. That's an amazing freebie listeners. So definitely jump on over to naturallyinspiredpodcast.com. You can also find Tammy on Facebook at Tammy Garcia, on Instagram, Tammy Cuthbert Garcia, and look up Naturally Inspired Podcast on YouTube. Thank you so much for your time, Tammy. We've had some amazing information and we will talk to you again in our next episode about your Naturally Inspired podcast. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Magic. This was a lot of fun. My pleasure. Listeners, this was your episode 143. Thank you again for your time. Go forth and create your magical life. Thanks for listening today. Please subscribe to hear future episodes, leave a review and share this podcast. You can follow us on Facebook at A Magical Life Podcast or at Holistic Natural Health Australia. That's holistic with a W. You can find us on Instagram at Holistic Natural Health or at www.holisticnaturalhealth.com.au. That's where you'll access all sorts of articles, freebies and more.